Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Information Office of the European Parliament and the representation of the European Commission in Austria, I want to welcome you here in the House of the European Union. Tonight's topic is a very serious one. Every year, millions of people are forced to leave their native countries looking for a safe place to work and live in. Wars, ethnical conflicts, political repressions or natural disasters are the cause of this involuntary migration. For many of them in the European Union, the European Union is the place to live on Earth because it provides a better, safer and fairer future. As you know, asylum is a fundamental right. The EU has been at the forefront for fighting for this right. The member states also have committed themselves to establishing a common European asylum system, a long, challenging and arduous process. It's still going on, as you know. Two legislative measures still remain subject to the approval of the European Parliament and the Council. As stated in the Commission's policy plan, three pillars underpin the development of the common European asylum system. First, bringing more harmonization to standards of protection by further aligning the EU member states' asylum legislating, legislation dealing with reception conditions for asylum seekers, asylum procedures and standards for qualification as refugees or persons needing international protection. Secondly, effective and well-supported practical cooperation. The European Asylum Support Office will progressively bring all activities related to practical cooperation on asylum under its roof notably in relation to co the a common approach of the country of origin information and to the common European asylum curriculum. It will also manage the asylum support teams and which are deployed in the EU states and which are in need of our support. Last but not least, we're talking about the need for increased solidarity and sense of responsibility among the EU member states and the non-EU member states. It is necessary to improve the Dublin system and establish solidarity mechanisms so that adequate support with a strengthened impact can be offered to EU states whose asylum systems are, as you know, under pressure. Under this pillar, collaboration between the EU and non-EU countries will be intensified, for example, through regional protection programs and resettlement. And I'm very happy that we're having a Commission representative today here uh, present who is the specialist for resettlement questions. Presently, burdens are distributed unequally across Europe. Some 327,000 asylum seekers were received in the European Union in 2012. An increase of nearly 8% on the previous year. As it stands, 90% of the asylum seekers are taken in by only 10 member states. That means that the other 17 member states, and soon 18, could do a lot more. And the recognition rates differ seriously. For Sudanese asylum seekers, for example, the recognition rate is 2% in Spain, but it is 68% in Italy. We must not accept such disparities in the European Union and we want to build up not only an economic, but also a political union. A union of values and humanity. Therefore, we have to share responsibilities for refugees, and this can only be achieved by using more European strategies and living more solidarity between the member states. 
The Commission sig uh, commits significant funds uh, to support the Member States in migration issues. The general program, which is named Solidarity and Management of Migration Flows, allocates almost 4 billion euros for the period from 2007 until 2013. It ensures a fair share of the financial burden that arises from integrated management of the Union's external borders and from the implementation of common asylum and migration policies. And in the same period, the European Refugee Fund received 700 million euros. They are used for various things, for capacity building, for asylum procedures and reception infrastructures, but also for the integration of refugees and for resettlement measures. At the moment, most, the Member States mostly set their priorities concerning resettlement programs at a national level. Instead of this lack of structural cooperation, we think that a joint EU resettlement program should be established to achieve a fully integrated European asylum policy. For implementation, as you know, NGOs play a key role. Therefore, the European Commission puts an emphasis on the lively exchange between all stakeholders, and this is what you are here for tonight. Our goal must be to harmonize procedures, reception conditions, and qualification rules in all 27 member states, and soon 28. Our ambition should be to see the European Union uh, and its policy as a benchmark for migration and asylum policy worldwide. You are here to work achieving this goal and the European Commission does its best to pave the way. What we now need is political will and commitment to do the extra mile. Thank you very much. Sorry, I, I now pass the floor to the Secretary General of Amnesty International here in Austria, Mr. Heinz Patzelt. Good evening and a very warm welcome on behalf of Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for Human Rights, Amnesty International in Austria, uh, holding this lecture. And thanks so much for, let's say, the European Union long title is very, very long, Commission, Parliament, especially Commission and Parliament. It's not the European Union, to be very clear, uh, giving us room, space and uh, share our, our, our event. Uh, listening to you, I, I, I had sometimes the feeling that, oh no, oh no, that's not true, that's not true, that's not true. But on the other side, of course it's true. If you look to the member states, most of them are seriously violating the human right to asylum, to be very clear on that. And it's very easy to bash the European Union for that, that it's not better. But being realistic, I don't want to know where we would be if there wasn't a European Union with a commission, with a parliament, with tough and progressive positions. Uh, how would member states, being non-member states, just on their own behave on the right of asylum? I think it wouldn't exist anymore in Europe. So therefore, nothing to bash and blame the European Union although there are a lot of problems, like a non-working Dublin system, uh, nothing working better than Frontex, and, 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 but it's the member states who don't allow to be better. It's the European Union who tries to improve, and that should be very, very clear for me. Sometimes I have the feeling if the interior ministers of the Union go to Brussels or wherever, it's a little bit like young people going to the youth club, where parents are away, where you could really do dirty things. And afterwards you go home, wash your hands and behave and Papa and Mama are there and everybody's happy and they say, oh, I would like have to be better, but the others were so ugly. It's not me. And that's how the system really works. And I think it's extremely necessary to work against that, to speak about it, and not only to speak about the obvious human rights violations in not fulfilling the right to asylum. Uh, we had a funny discussion when we were preparing on that, how do we call what here happens or not happens on resettlement? Is it a human rights violation? Obviously not. There is no human right to resettle. To be very clear, there is no human right to migration. Governments of the states of the world 
never manage to agree on that. But how would you call it if there are people in tremendous need, somebody could help and is actively looking away? I would call it at least a shame. And the issue is not so big. There are millions and millions of refugees in the world. Manfred Novak will tell a little bit more concrete about that afterwards and the colleagues on the plenary, on the, on the, on, on the panel. Uh, <clears throat> but it's quite few people who drop out of all kind of supporting system. Just hanging in limbo between borders, like it was after the Libya crisis, or having no chance to go to anywhere, like many people from Somalia still. Uh, it's about seven, eight hundred thousand people confronted with this problem of having nobody who is responsible for them, just hanging around without any support, without any hope, without any future. And if we would manage to reduce this number by about 180,000 a year, then this problem could be easily solved. 50% of that solution are covered by the United States, by Canada and by Australia. That's about 70,000 people who are recepted in that kind of direction. Not always on a fair basis, of course. Uh, I just heard a joke about how English-speaking countries would do resettlement, just asking who speaks English, who has a diploma, just gets one step forward. That's not the kind of resettlement policy that's fair, of course. Uh, perhaps it's not really true, but I think there's something similar to that. But if you look to Europe, the European Union, the area of Europe, where we call ourselves a region of human rights, of safety, of peace, they don't manage to do the other half of the part. It's only 4,000 people a year who are resettled to the European Union. And that, frankly, is ridiculous. Seeing the resources we have, seeing the needs we would have on that, the possibilities that we could offer, that's a shame. And that's where we should discuss today how we can get further on that, how we could improve, and how we can get a little bit more away from a shameful human rights understanding from the European Union member states. I wish you a fruitful discussion. Thanks for joining. Thanks you for joining on that lovely weather, and have a fruitful discussion. Nice evening today. Yeah, good evening. Welcome. As Heinz Batzel has said, at this beautiful spring evening sitting in here and participating in one of our human rights talks. Anna Müller Funk is the person primarily responsible for organizing these human rights talks on behalf of the research platform Human Rights in the European Context of the Vienna. University. It's an interdisciplinary research firm, six faculties, 12 institutes, working jointly in the field of human rights. The Boltzmann Institute of Human Rights, and we are very happy that we organize this human rights talk, A Life on Hold, Refugee Resettlements in the European Union, together with Amnesty International, the European Commission, European Parliament bureaus in Austria and it is supported by the Austrian newspaper The Standard, Siege Television, Civil Society Television, and Juridicum. We will, at the beginning, <coughs> watch a short video um, on the refugee camps in Jordan, which has been produced by Arman and Aras uh, Riachi, I think Arman Riachi is here uh, this evening uh, with us. And then uh, we will have uh, a discussion, first a panel discussion, and I will shortly introduce the, uh, the speakers on the panel and uh, a general discussion, so there will be enough time for you to raise questions, comments, criticism, whatever, on this highly interesting, but at the same time also, <clears throat> as Heinz Basselt has already said, also rather distressing phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> just to put <clears throat> the figures somewhere in context, altogether there are about, and those are the latest statistics, 43 million displaced person, persons around the world. And as you know, 
the majority of them are many are internally displaced persons because they have no chance of leaving their country and becoming a refugee by crossing a border. Um, <clears throat> of those 43 million UNHCR, under UNHCR's mandate are about 10.5 million. Then we have the UNRWA Palestinian refugees. So altogether about 15.5 million of refugees. Of all them, there are about 1.6 in Europe. I'm not talking about the European Union, about Europe as a whole. 1.6 compared to 15.5, or if you wish, to 43 million. So for those who always say that all the refugees are coming to Europe, it's simply not true. And if we are now talking about resettlement, and we heard and in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, the right to asylum is a human right, it's explicitly recognized. That is very important. And what we are talking today is there a human right of resettlement? There is no specific human right of resettlement, but there is a human right to asylum, and there is a question of solidarity, that not most refugees would be hosted by poor countries in the south and the rich countries in the north, and in particular in Europe, um, are only hosting a very, very small number, and the same is in the resettlement process, but we will hear more about that from our speakers tonight. Uh, the first one is Christoph Pinter. He is Austrian, he's an Austrian lawyer, and he has been working since 1998 at the Austrian <laughs> office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, and since 2011 he is the head of this office. And we are very happy that we have two international guests, uh, Marcin Prus from the Netherlands. He is also a lawyer from Maastricht, uh, and he is a practicing lawyer. He worked in the field uh, of migration and, and human rights. He worked for the Dutch government, uh, and he is now, as we heard already, the policy officer for asylum and migration, representing the European Commission here. We are also very happy to welcome Charlotte Phillips. She is an anthropologist and uh, international development studies at the School for Oriental and African Studies in London. She has done many fact-finding missions uh, in the field of refugee migration in Jordan, Tunisia, Qatar. And for the last four years, she has been working for Amnesty in the refugees and migration rights teams of the International Secretariat of Amnesty International in London. Welcome. <laughs> and last but not least, we have one of the most well-known uh, researchers in Austria on international migration and integration research. He is a political scientist. Um, he is working at the Danube University in Krems, uh, and he is a senior researcher there. Office of the International Center for Migration Policy Development, ICMPT in Vienna, Bernhard Berchinik. Very much welcome also on this panel. <laughs> so we are starting now with the video, and then I will ask our four panelists to come here for the panel discussion, followed by a public discussion. بعد كنت هلا ما كنت رح تلعبوا معنا بالالعاب من هيك عم يلعبوا الاولاد هاي 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 انا كثير حاسس بنفسي انه نحن لانه بس عم نبني وطن بدفع الثمن هيك بدفع الثمن تشرد اهلنا بدفع الثمن انه بلاقي 100 طفل واقفين متجمعين على باص مشان ياخذوا شويه مربى وشويه ملبس وشويه سكاكي انه جاي انسان غريب من برا يعني برا هالسور هذا المحدد 
جايين ناس بس بده يشوفوه بده يعطوه بده يعطوه سكره ممكن هديه ما بيعرف شو هي ممكن تكون بالونه بس انه جاي مش في حدا هيك غريب جاي فهو مبسوط فيه هي الحاله بتكفي بتقول لك انه هو قديش يعني بعيد عن الناس شوي ثاني حاسس حرص من العالم على الحيطان على البيوت هدول هيك ناس بيحكوا معهم بتعامل هدول ناس غرب بيحونوا ثاني يوم يرسموا غيرهم انه يصير في وجه جديد كل يوم هاي تسالي هاي بنات هاي بنات هاي نزلتي هلا؟ فتحتيها لسامي هلا؟ لما تبكي؟ يلا روح اسمها بتروح اجيبها روح شو بدي اعرف؟ هي كانت عم تبكي Yeah, all right. Perhaps also starting what we have just seen. Uh, I will start with Christoph Pinter. Um, we talked a little bit about the general situation of, uh, of refugees in the world and in Europe, but uh, this evening we talk about resettlement, and that's not about millions, that's about thousands, or perhaps hundreds of thousands, but not more. Can you tell us a little bit what's the, the program of UNHCR and where do we stand today, what has been achieved, but what are the big challenges and also wishes to Europe and the European Union? Yes, thank you very much. Um, also, thank you for the invitation and the possibility here to participate in this panel discussion on resettlement, which is a very important issue for UNHCR, both globally and here in Austria. Um, maybe let me start a little bit. What is, UN, uh, what is resettlement? Why do we need resettlement that urgently? In UNHCR's view, resettlement is one of three durable solutions. So if no voluntary return and no local integration for refugees is possible, the third option, resettlement, comes into play. And resettlement is, in this way, a protection tool which can really help saving lives and is therefore, as already mentioned, very important for us. Manfred, you asked what are the, the needs. We heard already um, a couple of figures today uh, when preparing uh, for today. Um, uh, I came across the figure of about 860,000 refugees in need of resettlement. These are the estimates by UNHCR in the mid-term or even longer term. As there is no chance to resettle 860,000 persons in one year, we tried to um, split them a, a little bit, these figures, and the most urgent needs defined for 2013 um, is about 180,000 refugees, which are, so to say, urgently in need of resettlement. How does resettlement work? UNHCR identifies the resettlement needs globally, so we come to the figure of 180,000 for this year, and then there are a number of states in the world cooperating with UNHCR in so-called resettlement programs. And these states and UNHCR meet in Geneva and discuss what uh, could be done to accommodate the needs. And for 2013, it was already mentioned, I think, about 80,000 places were offered, so less than 50% for the most urgent needs, just to put these figures maybe a little bit into perspective. I think it was also mentioned already which countries are the ones who do resettlement. Um, firm figures are available for 2011, not yet for 2012. This will be published in the coming weeks. But just to give you some kind of indication, the biggest resettlement countries are the US, Canada and Australia. The US resettled more than 43,000 persons in 2011. Canada about 7,000, Australia about 5,600. Altogether we had, if I'm not mistaken, um, 26 resettlement countries only globally, among them 15 EU member states. Nevertheless, it is interesting to note that these 15 EU member states in 2011 um, resettled um, Heinz Batzelt mentioned it already, I think, about 4,100 cases or persons. This is less than 7% of the global resettlement needs. So from UNHCR's perspective, there could be done more at the European level, in particular at the EU level. It was already mentioned in the 
introductory words of Manfred and Heinz. Uh, and if I get a step forward coming to Austria, our wish as UNHCR would certainly be that also Austria joins the EU resettlement scheme. This is so far not the case. We hope that in the near future Austria will also join the club and start with resettlement to Austria. This is nothing completely new for Austria. Austria was already engaged and involved in resettlement um, decades ago, I must say, um, but nevertheless. And what I also always would like to point out is that Austria benefited a lot from resettlement in the past. If we talk about refugee protection in Austria, we always mention the Hungarian crisis in the mid-50s of the last century, where within a couple of weeks, 180,000 refugees from Hungary crossed the borders and came to Austria and were welcomed here. But in the after-war time of the Second World War, Austria was not able to cope with this refugee population. So resettlement was done. Within, again, a couple of weeks and months only, 160,000 out of these 180,000 people were resettled overseas. So this was a sign of solidarity. This was a clear sign of help for a country overburdened with a refugee population. And we think that now um, Austria, in a new position, 60 years, 70 years later, should maybe become a resettlement country and also providing resettlement space for urgent cases. Thank you. Thanks very much, Christoph. I should have said at the beginning that we, of course, invited uh, the Austrian Minister of Internal Affairs, Mrs. Mikkel Leitner, um, and unfortunately she couldn't come, but uh, then we asked her whether she would be able to send somebody else to represent her who might be knowledgeable in the field of resettlement, but unfortunately she couldn't find anybody. Uh, so <laughs> that's why the ministry is unfortunately not represented because of course there are questions raised, what is the role of Austria? And, um, but I would first like to ask Martin Prus. Um, we heard now that only about 7% of all persons who have been successfully resettled were resettled within the 27 EU member states or the 15 that participated in the resettlement program. Um, what are the challenges? What are the expectations? Recently, uh, also Germany joined. Um, what are your experiences in negotiating with other countries, of course, including Austria? Um, and where do you see that the EU policy in that respect is going to in the next years? Uh, thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor. And uh, thank you all for coming and also for giving me the possibility to uh, elaborate on the subject. <clears throat> Maybe just to give you a little background and also in addition to what my colleague from UNHCR just mentioned, how resettlement and resettlement policy is uh, organized at this point within the European Union. I would like to start off, and I cannot emphasize this enough, that it is and it has always been a uh, policy question for member states to decide themselves whether or not they want to join the resettlement efforts, and if so, to what measure and in what way they wish to participate in any resettlement program. As already mentioned by UNHCR, uh, more than a half of the uh, UNH of uh, uh, European member states is already participating in resettlement efforts. Some of them have a very large, a very uh, old tradition of resettlement. For instance, Sweden. Sweden has been resettling, uh, resettling refugees since 1950s, if I'm not mistaken. Netherlands is another country that has a, a very uh, old tradition of resettlement, but there is, and this is why I'm glad to say so, there is also new member states joining up. Germany, for instance, is stepping up uh, uh, its uh, resettlement efforts. Only a couple of years ago, a country like Romania, for instance, decided to resettle a number of refugees. It was not a very large number, but it was the very first positive gesture of solidarity, and you know, as, you, as, as sometimes you might 
you might say tiny drops of water make, make a mighty ocean. Commissioner Malmström and the European Commission's position has always been that resettlement is one of the durable solutions and it's a gesture of solidarity but also a gesture of uh, responsibility sharing with refugees uh, uh, outside the European Union. There are of course other way of showing solidarity such as for instance financial assistance but this is one of the most tangible and one of the most personal level uh, ways in which, uh, uh, in which we could show solidarity. With regards to efforts and the policies, I'll try not to be too technical, but just to give you a glimpse, there is a thing called European Refugee Fund, as already uh, uh, mentioned under the Re European Refugee Fund, there is a amount of money that is um, earmarked for, for resettlement. Uh, so for resettling states within the uh, uh, European Union can actually financially benefit from resettling refugees depending on whether you do it for the first time or whether you've been doing it for quite some time, you can receive a lump sum and on top of that uh, uh, from the European Refugee Fund there is also other activities such for instance as integration activities that can be partly financed uh, by the European uh, Commission. Um, it is true, and I must admit it, that the efforts that all the European member states combined are making at this point are dwarfed by what other resettling uh, states are doing, such as, for instance, the United States. But I truly believe that we are on the right path, and as, for instance, comparing to 2000 and uh, 12 and 2011, the number of pledged places under the ERF is steadily growing there, and also the number of member states that are resettling is steadily growing. So, no, we won't be there by tomorrow, we will not exceed the efforts of the United States by tomorrow, but we are on the right path. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Charlotte Phillips, you have been now for the last four years a campaigner at uh, the, the big power under the human rights NGOs, Amnesty International in London. Uh, of course, Amnesty International was always active also in putting pressure on countries uh, to improve their asylum and migration policies. So how would you see and what's the main concerns of Amnesty International in relation to the resettlement policies? Is this on? Yes. All right. Um, well, as mentioned, the focus of Amnesty's work is really on campaigning and lobbying for increased resettlement places globally for the most vulnerable refugees. So in that, obviously, the EU is a key player, but also we lobby um, other countries as well, both in terms of increasing places already available or where there isn't a resettlement program starting one. Um, I think it was touched upon earlier, but why does Amnesty work on this issue? Um, as mentioned, there is no human right to resettlement and there is no obligation on the state to accept refugees um, through the resettlement programs. The reason why it's important to us is because it is a key tool for protecting the rights of refugees. It is a lifeline for some of the most vulnerable refugees in the world, women and children, um, torture survivors, um, others affected by trauma. Um, and it's also a lifeline for those who continue to be at risk um, in the country of first asylum, so they fled their country, they're in a neighbouring country, but they, their lives are still at risk. Uh, maybe it's an, a, a political profile or something else. Um, it also is quite strategic, um, because when you take refugees out of a certain context for resettlement, you open up the protection space for those who are left behind. So it works both for those who, who are actually resettled out and, and those who remain in, for example, the neighbouring countries. Um, and also, as mentioned, it is key in terms of solidarity and responsibility sharing. It is something tangible that the international community can do. Um, and for this reason, uh, we see it as a, as a very, very important issue. As a campaigning organisation, um, one of the main things that we try to do is, is give a human face to the issue. I mean, we, we have talked a lot about the technical aspects and there are a lot of statistics out there. They are very important, but we do also try to bring it back to the individuals involved. And I think just to touch on the film, I made a few notes um, whilst that, that great uh, short film was, was being shown. And I think it really highlights a few issues. I mean, just to be clear, um, there is no call for resettlement for Syrians at the moment. But I think 
just looking generally at the scene that we saw, we see that people flee conflict. They end up in, in refugee camps often in extremely difficult conditions. You know, the environment is difficult, but, you know, in deserts, in border areas which are insecure. You, they are not places that are good for children. Um, and people cannot work. They are reliant on, on aid. And their lives are literally put on hold um, until some kind of resolution is found. And I think for some of those refugees, resettlement is the only solution and will be the only way in which they can start their lives again. So for us, it's very important to look at the individuals uh, behind the statistics and, and try to highlight some of the stories. I can, in terms of what we're advocating for... Um, okay, so obviously we're advocating for an increase in resettlement places. You've heard the statistics that you could and should be doing much, much more. And we're part of a, um, a sort of a, a coalition campaign um, calling for the EU to resettle 20,000 people by 2020 a year. Um, we've also been calling for something which is called emergency resettlement, which is in addition to the annual quotas that states have, so you know, every year they would pl pledge to resettle a certain amount of people, in addition to that, we're asking that states have a pool of, of places, a flexible pool of places, so that when there is a crisis, when there is an emergency, and when people need to come out of a situation very quickly, they can be resettled without depleting what we know is already a very, very small number of places that are available globally each year. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have also been calling for the diversification of the people who are resettled. Now, um, for us, I mean, we're very much in line with UNHCR. It is really important that it is the most vulnerable people that are resettled. So they are resettled because they are women at risk or girls at risk, um, unaccompanied minors, and so on and so forth, not because of their religion, their nationality, their integration potential. But really, this is targeting the most vulnerable and for whom... It is really a life or death matter in some situations. So that is what we've been calling for. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Bernard Berginik. Um, you've done a lot of research in the overall policy on migration, integration, etc. Um, now, in Austria, we always hear that um, yeah, the asylum procedures are difficult because uh, most of the people who are seeking asylum are not really refugees, etc. Now, now we have to do with others. They are refugees. They have been screened before. Um, so we know that there are really people who have been persecuted uh, and who are in need of protection. So why is it so difficult now in relation to these people uh, for Austria or also other European countries to actually show solidarity uh, and to integrate them in an overall migration policy. Thank you. Um, let me answer on two levels. First, maybe on the on the level of the European Union, and then on the Austrian level. I, uh, from from some years in research, I got the impression that. Uh, Polit political decisions are not only shaped by interests, but also by the culture of organizations where they are drawn and when they, where they are taken. And a certain type of procedure uh, leads, an institutional setting uh, leads to certain uh, effects. And in the European Union, we have something which Hans Batzelt has very well described as a kindergarten in this field, which is called in political science intergovernmentalism, uh, meaning a decision procedure where the member states, and in particular the ministries responsible, are responsible for decision making and where the European Commission and the European Parliament, which are kind of some representatives of the principle of this realismus, of realism, uh, as which parents usually have towards their children, uh, don't have a lot to say. Uh, so in this intergovernmental forum, and this is mainly the case in the field of migration policy, uh, there is a race to the bottom. And this race to the bottom uh, is... Uh, played uh, with regard to populistic pressure in the, in the member states, uh, but also uh, with regard to kind of personal beliefs of ministers. Most of the ministers of the interiors we have now around in the European Union don't believe in solidarity. So I say this very frankly. Uh, you don't hear any words of ministers of the interior speaking about a solidarity Europe. You don't hear this anymore. The ministries of the interior are really risky for the European unification and for, for political union. This is the first thing. So we need a different setting uh, for migration policy at the European Union, bringing the European Commission and the European Parliament uh, into a better position vis-à-vis -vis 
the ministries of the interior. That's the first thing. Uh, with regard to Austria, I do think we have um, also a situation where this history uh, of uh, a negative discourse on asylum and migration um, has kind of set a, a mindset within the bureaucracies, uh, seeing asylum seekers, seeing refugees mainly from a negative perspective. Uh, this might change if we have this group of resettled people, this mindset has to change. And resettlement could also be a tool for changing the discourse uh, and for re-evaluating asylum. Uh, asylum, the institution of asylum has been in the discourse, political discourse uh, in Austria, devaluated. So we are speaking about asylum seekers most often in the newspapers as people who are suspect uh, of misusing asylum procedures. And if we uh, would move to resettlement, this could be changed. And this is also the reason why I think the ministries don't really want to move to, to, this, to this, because then they would have to change their mindset and their institutional setting. So I think it could be a tool, uh, but as other uh, developments in, in migration law, for example, the situation of long-term residents, this has to be in, uh, uh, imposed on Austria. The positive developments in the last 10 years came by the European Union, were installed by the European Union, and were imposed on Austria. And I think this is also necessary. But that's exactly the point, this change of the mindset. What could, and I put the question to both of you actually, was what could civil society do in order to assist, on the one hand, UNHCR, but also the European Commission uh, in changing this mindset by focusing on refugees who are in need of resettlement, who are not asylum seekers, who are refugees? Well, maybe to answer the question what could be done, and as it was already elaborated by uh, Mr. Fassenbender, there is sometimes a tendency to bash on the Commission, sometimes to bash on the European Union, but the Commission has only as much power as it was given by the member states and whether or not within the political context of a member state it is opportune or not opportune to share a part of sovereignty or share a part of competence to make new rules with the commission and then by commission I also mean the rest of the European institutions, also the parliament. It's very often a political decision and well, I don't want to cause a political scandal here, so I'm not going to in, engage on, on internal and uh, in internal uh, political discourse. But I would say it's down to down to you. It's down to political activists. It's down to voters. It's down to civil society to try to convince, at national level, your own policy makers to act in a different way. And could you perhaps give us? Uh best practice example from within the European Union to say that is a country that has taken comparatively, a comparatively high number and there were no problems in integration after resettlement etc. that we could use in the advocacy work in relation to the Austrian government. I don't think there is one single example of a country. As I mentioned, there are different political traditions, there are different historical traditions, there are also different cultural backgrounds when it comes down to integration and resettlement of refugees. Sweden and Netherlands are always the usual suspects when it comes down to providing an example for resettlement. These are the countries that uh, resettle large numbers, relatively large number, numbers within the European uh, quotas. They almost amount for, the two of them, for more than a half of all the resettled places. Uh, however, as I said, tiny drops of water make a mighty ocean. Even for countries like Romania, for instance, to resettle in the beginning a number just to show their goodwill and political gesture, but also in, in this way to, to learn new experiences, how to integrate those refugees. So I would not say that there is a one single example. I would rather say that there are many examples of many good actions and that as a whole we are moving in, into the right direction. Uh, referring to the 20,000 by 2020, it's one of the ideas that, that our commissioner supports. Uh, we do realize that at this point, comparing to the efforts of, of other resettling nations, although we are doing good work, we could do better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, um, coming back to your original question, what could or can the civil society do? And I think the civil society can do a lot, and it does a lot already. 
um, just to mention the initiative mentioned by Charlotte with 20,000 for 2020, but I also would like to mention the so-called Save Me campaign in Germany, where the issue of resettlement was a bottom-up issue. So it were the cities, the municipalities, which put pressure on their local politicians saying, we want to do resettlement, we want to have resettled refugees in our communities. And finally, it came up that Germany resettled 2,500 refugees, Iraqi refugees, and is now changing its position. Um, it's a little bit debatable how well this resettlement program of Iraqis was done, but nevertheless now Germany joins the club, has a quota of 300 per year, and if this works well, we think this could improve and increase in the coming years. So I think the civil society is an important factor and does already a lot. Mm -hmm. Bernhard, do you think that Austria could follow this example? Germans are usually our... I, I hope so. Uh, although in, in the last years Germany uh, improved a lot with regard to immigration policies and Austria has not followed the example given, for example, the use solely provisions in, in German nationality legislation. Um, I think that uh, it would be... Uh, there was a dis debate on it already three years ago, and there are civil society actors prepared. There were, there were, at this time, there were churches attending, there were NGOs attending, so there is in civil society, I think there is openness towards it. I would also suggest the European Union to maybe make a little bit more use of their funds uh, in regard to policy making. I don't know a lot about the, f about the refugee fund, but I've noticed in, with regard to the integration fund that the European Commission has given all the decision powers to the ministries of the interior. So Actually, the European Commission has given away its possibility to influence policies uh, by funding, and it might be necessary to reconsider. It might be in, in the 1990s, the European, Commission, the European Commission was giving away about half of its funding by own decisions. Uh, so it might be necessary that also the European Commission reconsiders its way it influences policies. Mm -hmm. Charlotte, would you have from your experience uh of refugee advocacy work on the global level, any, any kind of good practices that you can say we could learn from? Yes, sorry, okay. Um, yes, I think so. I mean, just to go again back to the original question, I think with resettlement, one very important thing is, is around raising awareness of what exactly resettlement is. I think it, it can be quite a technical term and a technical topic and, and just talking to other people about what resettlement actually is and, and what the benefits are and, and what the, the, the human impact is when, when people are resettled, I think is, is really, really important. Uh, working with the media to try and highlight um, the benefits of resettlement and and I think you nature do this very well is, is is highlighting some of the really positive stories when people are resettled and then they're able to contribute to the societies that they're in and really showing those stories so people can see um, why you know it, it, it it's a win-win situation but for both the person that's being resettled and also for the community that is receiving them and I think that is all very um, positive um, in terms of like uh, some kind of good uh, good initiatives. I think we worked very closely with UNHCR um, around the Libya refugee crisis and um, as many of you will know in, in 2011 when the, the crisis uh, broke, when the conflict broke out, there were many refugees and asylum seekers from countries like Sudan, Somalia, Eritrea who were either living or transiting through Libya at the time and were forced to flee again um, to Egypt and Tunisia. Some of them maybe for the second or third time in their lives flee, uh, you know, leaving a conflict. Um, and at that point, uh, we went to see the refugees in the camps there and we found that people were literally stranded as, as has been talked about. You know, they couldn't go back to their home countries, places like Somalia. Uh, conflict and persecution would face them if they returned. They couldn't go back to Libya. We had been documenting human rights abuses but taking place there, including targeted attacks of sub-Saharan Africans, for example. And the Tunisian and Egyptian government had made it very clear that they were only going to be allowed to stay on a temporary basis. So these were people who literally had nowhere to go. And um, UNHCR, I mean, took the lead in this, but uh, we, we supported and a number of other partners supported in campaigning for um, places f for, these, for these refugees. And in fact, I think by then February of the following year, we had enough places for all the people. I mean, it was quite a small number, it was around 5,000, but a lot of countries did step forward. I mean, the US took, as is often the case, the bulk, but, but a, a number of other countries also, also agreed and resettled people. And now, 
while there are still some people in those camps, many have now started their new lives in, in Sweden, in Germany, and, and so on. And we, we follow them, we're in contact with them, and they're all doing really well. So that was a really nice example of where so a bit of campaigning and advocacy from lots of different parts, diff, you know, different pieces of the puzzle came together, and there was a, a good outcome in the end. Thanks very much. I think it's time for opening up the floor. Whoever wishes to comment, raise questions, criticism, etc., please identify yourself. There are two micros available. Um, and um, I think I would take a few questions and comments, and then I give back to the panel. Perhaps also identify if you have a very specific question to whom you would like to address it. I think here we have a first speaker. Hello, my name is Martin Wagner. I work for International Center for Migration Policy Development also, but also work before in NGOs, several NGOs. Um, I have a, actually a question. Um, we heard, or it was said before, that um, UNHCR has a resettlement program, and as far as I know or understand, there's before more or less uh, the screening by UNHCR done. Uh, I'm not quite aware how it is done with the EU resettlement program. How does this work technically? Because it was raised that uh, there would be a screening before one would avoid, let's say, a, a long-standing uh, procedure. I'm not quite aware how this uh, works on, on, on this level. And may I allow one more question, um, which is, um, I did some research in the past and heard often from countries uh, that said that um, we don't want to do resettlement because this would create a pull factor for people from this region. Is anyone aware of if this is a uh, right perception or if, this, um, uh, if there are some experience? I would be very interested about that. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Please. Uh, thank you very much. I'm originally from Ethiopia and live in Austria now, an Austrian citizen. The problem, I, my problem is the European legal system. The European legal system clearly says anybody persecuted because of this, this religion, personality, all these things has a right. If he's out of his country, doesn't want to be under the protection of his country, the right to apply for asylum. And that every young man reads thanks to the information system <clears throat> in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. So these young people, after seeing this, reading this, oh, let me go to this country. My rights will be respected. I will be taken care of my human rights. And they take all these risks. After reading this, and Europe has bordered herself very primitively, in a very primitive way, protects herself. If you see history of Europe, it was history of expansion. When Europeans and sisters, your ancestors, when they were bad economically, they moved. They used the same methods. There were people who were smuggling them. There were people who were selling them, buying them. That's why they went and occupied Australia. That's why they went and occupied USA. That's why Africa also. But now, Europe is denying this historical and human rights legal system. Not only the institutional, but intellectuals, lawyers. When they take this case, they try to interpret it totally differently. They start to hair splitting. Nobody is citing this genuine human rights issue. Young people, many of them died on their way trying to come to Europe. And there is no public outcry. There is no public protestation. And that is sad. That's why most young people who are born in Europe are mad with European cultural values, with European morals, and go the opposite. And actually, Europe is, I don't know if Europe does have any moral consciousness, or at all if Europe is really legitimate. And we have, we have told very small group of people are coming to Europe. Most of the refugees are living in these poor countries. But still, is Europe really morally justified to exist? The downfall of Europe may come because it's not fair. Thank you. I'm sorry. Mm, thank you very much. Please, in the first row. Good evening. Uh, 
Um, I especially have a question about the camp you mentioned in Tunisia, the Shusha camp. Uh, there are still many people there uh, who are not in the resettlement programs and the UN uh, HCR wants to close it in a few months. So these are only about two or three thousand people. What happens to these people? They cannot go anywhere. You mentioned it. So why they cannot be taken in resettlement programs? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And further in the back, I had first somebody asking for the floor. My name is Diana Karabinova. I work for the Austrian Red Cross and I'm also part of a working group called Resettlement. And I have two questions. One is uh, to Mr. Pross. Um, you said that the number of member states doing resettlement is increasing. But the overall numbers are decreasing because um, um, it's, it's great that um, you want to involve new countries in resettlement, but the receiving societies are also getting tired of resettlement, for example, Finland. And my second question is also to you, but a comment uh, to mi what Mr. Pehinik said. And um, he said that it's, um, it's better that such decisions are somehow imposed because um, in, there have been recomm recommendations about resettlement for quite a number of years, but there is no resettlement in Austria for many years now, for quite a number of years. So what would you say about that and about some other kind of legislation that really supports res involving more resettlement countries? And um, because in, in the end, this is quite a political decision, two years ago, um, last year, Spain started resettlement and uh, resettled 80 refugees. And it was the worst year for Spain with the economical crisis and uh, unemployment. Thank you. Mm, thanks very much. I saw first a hand some... Yes. Uh, my name is Mariana Cliati. I work for the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union here in Vienna. I would like to ask the panelists, why does the UNHCR, and this International, the Commission, direct their efforts to resettlement and not to an alternative system of applying for uh, asylum outside the European Union at the embassies of the states? Why depend on the goodwill of a certain government every now and then and not introduce this uh, system to the common European asylum system, impose it as an obligation to the states. And this would also save so many lives every year in the Mediterranean Sea. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, there's a last request for the floor. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And then we, we go back to the panel and have another round. Please. Thank you very much. My name is Mohamed Numan. I am a refugee here in Austria and just speaker of the refugees movement in Austria. First of all, I would like to say thanks to everyone for coming here and knowing what is the problem of the refugees. Because all the times they are speaking about the human rights and big bolts, the human rights, we are providing human rights. How many refugees, as you, as you said, you are welcoming them? Which kind of welcoming you are doing with them? How many refugees have to, leave, have to die? when they are flowing from here, when they are throwing back from these countries, and why only the refugees have to come to the Westerns? Because of the asylum? Or for the stupid talking about the human rights? And if you are a human, has you visited or have you talked to the, any refugees, why they have to come here? Or just you are looking at the asylum interviews, even you cannot provide good toll matches to the refugees. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think we give back now and then have another round. Who would like to start? I think the questions to all of you. Please. Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe with respect to the question on pull factors, um, honestly said, I don't really see any pull factor in doing resettlement. Resettlement is done, as we heard already, 
um, either as an ad hoc resettlement for emergency cases or in the context of a so-called regular resettlement program where the states provide certain places and commit themselves to resettle the given number of persons in a, in a given year. If the quota is then filled, then it's over for this year. So I do not really see where the, where there should be a pull factor. That's my personal view. Um, with respect to the question of the Susha camp, maybe, um, maybe some background information. How is resettlement done? What are the preconditions for resettlement? Resettlement is for refugees, so the first step which needs to be done is to do a refugee status determination procedure, an asylum procedure, so to say. This is done by UNHCR on the basis of the 1951 Geneva Refugee Convention. UNHCR staff members make an interview with the person and finally decide in a procedure whether the person is a refugee or not. If the person is rejected because he or she does not fulfill the criteria of the 1951 Refugee Convention, this person can also not join or qualify for a resettlement program. And without being an expert on the situation in Susha, maybe Charlotte can say more about it, um, there are rejected cases which are therefore not able to uh, be resettled. Um, and maybe with respect to the question of the Fundamental Rights Agency, uh, I think this is um, and I'm interesting to hear also from my commission colleague what he will say, but um, I think this is an interesting option and this is an option we, uh, which was in particular in the European context also practiced in the past that um, asylum or asylum seekers may approach an, an embassy abroad and file an asylum application there and that the first screening is done whether entry into the EU member state is allowed or not. Over the years all these procedures were abolished and I think Switzerland now followed as a last non-EU member state uh, example in the European context. I think it's politically difficult uh, now to again have the uh, go back the, to have the approach to allow this again and there are a number of questions in this context as well and I think this is maybe the key word for you, Marcin. Please. Thank you for the, for the questions and maybe just in addition to what was just said um, on the question with regard to uh, uh, why res resettlement is not introduced into the uh, regular uh, uh, legislation as I said, I don't want to co cause a political scandal here, but I couldn't agree more. Uh, but as I also said, um, the extent to which the Commission is able to uh, introduce legislation and to which uh, it is at the end of the day adopted does not necessarily depend on, the, and it only depends on the ambitions and the uh, vision of the Commission, but we also have to take into account um, political and uh, historical, how should I put it, uh, backgrounds in member states. As you know, also the Council and the European Parliament are co-legislators, so we would actually make no use to introduce measures of which we know that will be rejected by the, uh, the co-legislators. There is some discussion and there has been some discussion uh, going on for quite some time. I don't know if you recall about almost 10 years ago, it, there was an initiative introduced uh, by uh, Netherlands together with United Kingdom and if I'm not mistaken, Belgium, if I don't, if I, if I, if I recall correctly, um, it was called uh, protection in the region and there was a concept of creating a, as if it were, a layer of protection surrounding Europe with a possibility of more controlled or more managed, perhaps controlled is not to use, use the right word, but more managed uh, protection access to uh, European uh, Union. It was then, for political reasons, killed by several member states. Uh, so uh, you must realize that we operate in a highly political and also very highly sensitive area. Uh, but uh, yes, there is talk of, 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 of introducing some possibilities and it has been going on for years. Same applies to what was just mentioned by, by BNHCR, the so-called 
diplomatic asylum, the possibility of introducing an asylum claim at an embassy. Now all member states have abolished this possibility. Now the last one on the European continent was, uh, was Switzerland. For the time being, it does not seem like there is momentum to rekindle this discussion. Um, maybe a little... Uh, a little elaboration on, on the question of, uh, from ICMPD. Mr. Martin Wagner asked about the uh, uh, practicalities. Uh, at European level, it's uh, for the first time last year that we actually managed to agree on a set of priorities of which groups and which countries, uh, uh, from which countries to resettle. As long as a member state pledges and then resettles from a certain country or from a certain group. One of the groups is also vulnerable uh, 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 persons in need of uh, emergency resettlement. So there actually is a pool. There is actually already a possibility of creating a pool uh, for emergency resettlement. As long as one of uh, as, as a refugees is resettled under one of those priorities, member states is eligible uh, for funds. And then it's down to a member state to, to, to proceed at technical level, uh, whatever way they wish. Some member states uh, uh, do another screening, other member states just introduce a person and then provide uh, refugee status uh, uh, immediately. I must mention that this sort of activities uh, will and already is at, at a fledgling beginning uh, uh, scale being coordinated by the so-called European uh, uh, agents, uh, European support uh, European Asylum Support Agency, EASO. Uh, uh, we will see in upcoming years that some of these activities may actually be more coordinated by, uh, uh, by the Bureau. Um, with regards to, 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 to maybe the gentleman's question on, on why we allow for this to happen, um, I don't want to get involved into a delicate discussion, but as you assume, uh, protection of human rights, and this is also discourse at national level, um, is one of the fundamental values that we all share, but it is not the only driver for migration. There are also other considerations, uh, some of which might be, uh, might be economic, and this element plays a very important role at, at national discourse. I must say that uh, when it comes down to international level, uh, protection of human rights and promotion of human rights is one of the policy goals of, of, of the European Union that we try to promote in whatever way we can. One of the instruments when it comes down to protection is so-called uh, uh, RPPs, regional protection programs. These are programs aimed at supporting a country in developing long-term capacity building uh, in the area of, of, of refugee protection. So for instance, uh, we have a RPP regional protection program in, uh, in the Horn of Africa, and it's to allow countries in the region to cope with migration and refugee flows uh, uh, in a better way. So yes, there are already activities being undertaken uh, at this point. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Charlotte. Yes, um, quickly on, um, on Shusha. Um, so I mean, I think that is indeed the case that obviously it, in order to qualify for resettlement, you need to first be recognized as a refugee. And as we know, not everyone will necessarily fall within the convention. So. There are people there who um, did not qualify as refugees and therefore are not, uh, not able to be resettled. Um, the other issue has been that a lot of people um, from Shusha were accepted to the US. The US at the time open, um, offered an open number of places. And whilst the US resettles a lot of people, um, their resettlement processes take a lot longer than, than other countries. They, are, they um, apply quite stringent security measures and so on and so forth. So there are still people who, whilst having been accepted to the US, remain in the camp um, whilst they go through these various processes. And it is, again, one of the things that we've been campaigning for, which is you know, faster um, processing um, of resettlement cases. Um, I think that was, in, in terms of um, human rights um, of asylum seekers and refugees in Europe and trying to get to Europe, um, Amnesty has a big campaign at the moment called SOS Europe, uh, looking at some of these issues, including um, deaths at sea and so on, bilateral agreements, um, issues in Libya. And so you should definitely check it out if you uh, want to get involved in, in that kind of campaigning. Bernard. Yeah. Um Speak, uh, answering to the question of, of uh, more political scientist question on how to organize policy making in this field, 
Um, I would like to comment on that, and before saying that I'm not at all representing ICMPD here, I'm speaking as a political scientist. Uh, I think that there are certain areas uh, of human rights, but also other areas, where it makes sense uh, to remove them uh, from the area of policy making in the national arena. And uh, particularly human rights, but also part of migration are, are case in point, uh, and uh, because uh, these are case areas where politicians might come under pressure at the local level to respond to demands from the electorates, so imagine demands of the electorates, um, and uh, a certain setting uh, might, have, might drive uh, politic policy makers uh, to, to, to a race to the bottom. And therefore, I really pledge uh, for a way of stronger Europeanization of migration policy per se. I think that uh, we have a problem in the setting of European Union migration policies that not the community method, uh, but that we have this open method of coordination which is, which is applied in this field, which is a method giving a lot of leeway uh, to governments which are competing uh, at each other and giving too little powers to the European Commission. So my pledge would be that we should re re reconsider a moving parts of, of, of migration policies of the national decision and really uh, really cutting or really reducing the sovereignty of member states in these fields. I think we have seen in the last 10 years that movements which improved human rights of, of migrants have not been developed by the member states but have been imposed by the European Court of Justice or the European Commission. Thank you. Please. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Mir Jahangir. I'm uh, one of the sp spokesperson of the refugee protest came in Vienna. I have uh, two questions. First question, um, when will you going to start your resettlement, rest resettlement for refugee in Austria? Before election or after election? <laughs> and the second, uh, the second question, uh, before everybody said la last six months ago we start our protests in Vienna, capital of Austria because we have a, some kind of problem with, uh, in, asylum pro in our asylum procedure. And my question is that we already done a lot of uh, me uh, meetings with the higher authority like your UNFCR, Mr. Pinter. Nobody said, uh, the, our, everybody said we are not responsible for you. And this time our group also the part of the resettlement or whatever. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please. And one more thing, when you are going to stop keeping the responsibilities to another person's shoulders, because most of the authorities are saying, we are not responsible, somebody else, when they are not there, available. If they are, we will achieve to arrive to them and they will say, no, we are not responsible, somebody else is responsible. Till when you are going to play this game with all the humans, not only the refugees from here, all over the world, the same the politicians are having equal policy not to be a responsible. If you are not a responsible, why you are sitting in your posts? Why you are carrying their chairs? Give to somebody else. Thank you very much. Thank you. In the last row. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Daniela. I'm a student of the European Peace University in Schleining and um, I would like to ask two questions. Uh, it's about two different layers of discussion. The first one actually um, is uh, our situation here in Austria. Uh, as you already mentioned um, also on the podium, um, the migration politics and also resettlement politics uh, is really a very national topic. So Austria still um, is not participating even like in the European scheme. And so my question would be, uh, how can we also put pressure on uh, our government? I'm also an Austrian. Uh, and also from an international perspective, how can we put pressure also to Austria that there will be some kind of change, that there will be um, solidarity um, and there will be politics, we can all be proud of it. 
And um, my second question actually addresses uh, really the level of the European Union and the international level. So we had a very nice introduction and I'm very grateful for that. Um, so we heard some words also of a common vision so that Europe uh, should be and hopefully will be a, a benchmark for migration and integration politics in the world. And my question now is, but how can we as Europeans be a benchmark for this kind of politics if we still have an agency like Frontex? And uh, this, um, yeah, this puzzles me. It's maybe off topic, but I think maybe uh, you still uh, could uh, give me a little answer at least. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Ah, okay. My name is Ulla Pils. I've just heard in the news that Austria was condemned um, for its refugee policy um, concerning um, a ref uh, asylum seeker that fled from Chechnya to Austria. And the European Court of Human Rights um, said that the treatment in Austria um, was contrary to Article 3 of um, the European Convention on Human Rights. And I wanted to ask, if this would have any effect also on um, resettlement policy. Thank you. Here in the force, there are, there are two requests for the floor. Hello, um, my name is Marlene Naujox. I'm a supporter from the refugee camp Vienna. Uh, actually I actually have two questions. Um, also, uh, the woman before me um, went in a similar direction. Um, how useful is resettlement when um, the ways of choosing people who, who need resettlements or who are identified as, as refugees in needs are not really transparent or are in many cases um, just not, yeah, not really transparent? How, how can we guarantee that really the pe that there are not people who are really in need fall through through this? And uh, the second question is, uh, Mr. Pinter, you said that um, there is no use in in uh, suggesting leg legislations that will anyways be refused. Um, and I think that's the same problem with with um, the refugee camp getting not enough support from from, for instance, UNHCR or Amnesty International when you say that um, their um, demands are not realistic so we cannot support them because um, it's not our program and, and we will not find a way um, to solve this. Um, is it really um, good to say things that have no um, way of a positive outcome should, um, should just not be mentioned? Thank you. Can you just keep it in Give it to Anne Knapp. Thank you. Yeah, Anne Knapp, Asyl Österreich. I just want to know if the big refugee crisis in front of our house, I speak about Syria, and the hundreds of thousands of Iraqi refugees living there, and also the Syrian refugees, which are now in the surrounding countries, uh, would uh, give some um, push to the European Union and uh, maybe also to the um, UNHCR to, to demand more places for resettlement. Thank you. Uh, I have one more in the back and then I give back again to the panel. Uh, good evening. Rainer Zeit, uh, Youth Welfare of Austria. I have uh, also two questions. Uh, first, um, the European Asylum Support Office was mentioned, was already mentioned. I'm curious about uh, are there uh, specific initiatives uh, from uh, that office uh, in terms of uh, a harmonized uh, solution um, on resettlement? Is there a project or uh, any kind of initiative from uh, that office? And secondly, um, uh, as far as the unaccompanied minors uh, are concerned, uh, unaccompanied minors uh, especially uh, turning to an adult uh, as a vulnerable group, uh, they have, as far as we have experienced, um, uh, serious problems in um, a resettle uh, after um, getting granted asylum status. Is there in the in the um, in the ref settlement proje uh, project, in you know, a settlement program, and a specific uh, uh, thinking about that uh, kind of group. 
uh, in the, the problems of the unaccompanied minors getting uh, adult and uh, losing their, uh, their support from the legal, uh, from their legal advisors. Thank you very Thank much. You. Let's perhaps start the other way around with Bernhard and then... There were now quite, quite a lot of broad questions and I've already said that I'm, I'm more or less coming from migration uh, research. So I would like to reconnect uh, these questions uh, to a point I see important. I think, I think we should uh, discuss uh, this whole issue from the human rights perspective, but there's also an issue in, in, in it uh, regarding the framing of, of debates. And I think that uh, uh, in this debate uh, we should uh, see the possibility of reframing the asylum and refugee debate into a more uh, civilized version as we have it now by looking at these types of programs like, like resettlement programs which are very specific and which have, uh, which have uh, a very specific means and, and a different institutional structure. So my, my hope would be that uh, instead of maybe confronting asylum procedures with resettlement, uh, we could have a look at uh, how resettlement uh, procedures might help to improve the general situation of asylum and refugee seekers. Um, okay, just quickly on the refugee camp. I don't know anything about the situation, I'm really sorry. I'm guessing this is like something that's happening here in Vienna. So maybe I'm sure there are other Amnesty colleagues in the room who can probably um, answer your question. Um, so I'm sorry about that. But I mean, I, I think you're right that sometimes, y even though you know that nothing is going to change, you have a responsibility to make the human rights argument and to take a principled approach. I mean, I'm not say I don't know anything about this context, but in general, you know, we do try to to always take that kind of the human rights approach and, and make those arguments um, even when it's clear that governments um, don't like to hear it. It's important that someone plays that role. In terms of Syria, I'm, I'm surprised that, that a question on Syria came up so late. But um, yeah, I mean, I think um, Syria is a really, really um, terrible, tragic situation and it's very clear, you know, over 1.3 million refugees, I think, now at this point, that uh, the international community must do more. Um, the lion's share of, of, of the refugees are obviously in, in neighbouring countries and we're all aware that the situation there is very, very difficult. Um, in terms of what the international community can do, I think for the moment, um, from what I understand, UNHR is not pushing resettlement um, as a durable solution. There's still kind of there, there's still an emergency phase, and and it, a lot of it is about getting services and provisions and life-saving support to the people as they come out um, of Syria. And it's it's clear that certainly um, more money is needed. I mean, to put it bluntly, that that. I think the, the regional response plan for Syria, which is you know, to fund the refugee situation, is 31% uh, funded. Uh, a lot more needs to be done. I think the international community has been very strong in condemning the violence in Syria and been pretty weak in terms of responding to those who actually make it out with their lives. So I think that's clear. Um, um, but in terms of resettlement, I, that, I don't know for it quite at that stage. There was a flash appeal for um, refugees who were in Syria at the time. So again, you know, um, not, not Syrians, but Afghanis, et cetera, et cetera, who got caught up in the violence and they are being resettled out. But you can imagine that operationally it must be very, very difficult to achieve, but, but people are being taken out by road to Beirut and, and flown uh, to resettlement countries when, when they've been accepted. A lot of them were already waiting for resettlement when the conflict actually uh, broke out. Martin? Yes, maybe just a little addition. Um, we are aware of the situation in, in, in Syria, of course, and as, 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 a, as a whole commission in the European Union, we are following with, with, with great concern. Uh, I must, uh, without trying to be boastful, uh, say that EU, together with the member states, is for the time being the biggest humanitarian donor uh, uh, when it comes down to this, uh, supporting the displaced person refugees in Syria and, uh, and outside Syria. Now, the needs are greater than the, the possibilities uh, and the resources, but we are doing uh, uh, all we can. When it comes down to answering a question on, on, on resettlement, UNHCR, as uh, my colleague from Amnesty already said, 
has not called for resettlement of Syrians from the countries surrounding uh, uh, Syria. EU is following uh, the UNHCR point of view, or UNHCR's point on on uh, on this question, just as on any other resettlement group or resettlement uh, situation. Um, EASO, yes, indeed. Um, whether EASO is doing anything, um, yes, EASO is doing something. Um, EASO, you have to remember, is a fledgling organization. It only began, it only started a couple of years ago. Only last year did it become independent from the Commission. Um, so you must not expect wonders from an organization that is still in the face of being set up and has not fully matured. Uh, there is a very interesting project called Resettlement Project, which was developed by EAS together with UNHCR. Uh, it was partly funded by the, by the Commission. It basically tries to bring uh, practitioners uh, to share best practices, but it's one of the first uh, 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 initiatives. And rest assured, in the future there is going to be many more initiatives by EAS, but also by the European Commission uh, on Resettlement. Uh, brief answer on, on the position of uh, unaccompanied minors or minors in general. Uh, minors are recognized under the European uh, Refugee Fund and then the e EU uh, Joint Resettlement Program as one of special groups that might be in need of resettlement. Now, it is correct what you are saying. We are aware, and but it's again a national uh, uh, discretion that sometimes there is problems with in integration when they turn the age of 18. Um, but it's, on the other hand, an arbitrary uh, uh, limit. We agreed in a number of international uh, uh, instruments that 18 is the age of majority, and when you turn 18, you should and have also the right to decide for yourself. Uh, so no, there is going to be no initiative, and there is no initiative to push the limit of majority uh, beyond 18. And Frontex? Um, Frontex, how can we how can we have meaningful uh, uh, resettlement when there is such an organization? Or Frontex, you have to. Um, um, I do realize and I do recognize that there is uh, a lot of negative publicity when it comes down to Frontex, whether it's justified or not. It's a different discussion. Uh, this is not the topic of our discussion uh, today. But I would like to decouple them. I would not like to place resettlement in in the context of, of Frontex resettlement really is and remains a sign of solidarity with the ones who are in need of a permanent solution. Uh, Frontex does not play any role, has no position in resettlement whatsoever. I would say it's even the country. It's us extending our generosity to countries outside and refugees outside the European Union and allowing them the possibility to, uh, to enter and to receive protection uh, within the European Union. So it has nothing to do with Frontex. I cannot possibly conceive uh, how, how one discussion could, could influence the other. Thank you. Christoph. Yes, thank you. Um, maybe coming to the, to the heart of resettlement again. Um, when does UNHCR resettlement? Resettlement is done if there is no state asylum procedure, but UNHCR is doing the asylum procedure, and then there are two options. First, as a life-saving measure, as already heard, in emergency cases this can happen very quickly, or in the context of regular resettlement programs if there are no perspectives of return and local integration. Resettlement in UNHCR's view should go from developing countries where no options are available, where no protection is available, to industrialized countries and not the other way around. So UNHCR is not going for resettlement from European countries to somewhere else, but from developing countries mainly where, as we heard already, 80% of the refugees um, are located to Western European uh, and in, in particular industrialized countries globally. Um, in terms of, uh, of criteria, um, I think the Criteria you, um, used by UNHCR are very transparent. They are even, uh, you can download them from the UNHCR website. Um, maybe just to repeat, not every refugee qualifies for resettlement. There, need, uh, there is a need for um, 
for uh, particular elements in addition to the refugee um, qualification, just to, to mention maybe some, we have heard it already, separated children with special risks, women and girls with special risk, persons with family members somewhere uh, in a resettlement country, victims of torture and uh, other, uh, and victims of, uh, of violence, um, people in risk of deportation, uh, in violation of the no refoulement principle, for example. So an additional, uh, additional criteria which are clearly set out and which are the basis for UNHCR's selection process. Um, last but not least, no, not last but not least, um, is, it, um, is it justified not to submit um, irrealistic, uh, unrealistic requests, so to say, no, you are certainly right. Um, uh, you shouldn't just accept realities and um, adjust your policies and uh, your activities in this context. Nevertheless, I think, um, as we have heard uh, in the context of embassy procedures, um, you also need to decide where you put your focus on and where you... Sorry? Choose your battles, yeah, so to say. Uh, and I think um, we have faced uh, a development in the past which we cannot neglect uh, and where we as a, in a, in a policy decision, so to say, are of the opinion that at the moment there is hardly any chance to achieve, again, the introduction of embassy procedures. This is uh, not a position in general that we not, do not go for it. Uh, I mentioned it before. There are many questions around it. Uh, just to mention thousands of applications in one embassy, who is screening these cases, where are the persons waiting for the decision, and so on and so forth. That's no easy thing. Um, yes, and in this context, maybe also with respect to the refugee protest, um, what we always mentioned is the mandate of UNHCR. We have a clear and maybe too narrow mandate uh, to support the refugee protest without any conditions. There are requests by the refugees um, which are clearly out of UNHCR's mandate, which we cannot support, but there are others, as already mentioned, which we support and uh, which are part of our advocacy work on a daily basis. And last but not least, now really, I would like to refer to the European Court of Human Rights, the decision in Strasbourg against Austria in the case of a Chechen asylum seeker. I think the decision is very interesting and um, it's certainly helpful to read it very carefully because there are statements about the situation, the human rights situation in Chechnya made by the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and I think in particular with respect to the region of Chechnya, there's not so much country of origin information available for the asylum procedure that this judgment, this ruling could be a, a good reference point for other asylum procedures as well. Nevertheless, we always have to bear in mind that this is an individual decision and that there was no general assessment by the court as it was, uh, for example, done uh, in January 2011 with respect to Greece uh, and returns under the Dublin context. Mm, thank you very much. Also a very warm welcome to Arman Reachi, one of the two filmmakers, and we will also still see a trailer before we end this uh, discussion, but I should like to have a last short round. Uh, I see the first one, two, and perhaps a third one, uh, and then we round up the discussion. Yeah, Please, you, you have the floor. My name is Hirut Kiesel from uh, Discover TV. Um, I just want to be straight ahead and, and try. I, I, I try to understand what you guys are talking about, which is quite interesting. But let me try to approach you with a very practical example. It means the other way. Um, if you say to Vatican right now, I just don't want to go away to any religious topics. The head of this institution is a person whose parents were migrants. We have another fact, we will stay in Latin America. The head of Brazil is a woman who, her parents came from Bulgaria. We, have, we, we don't have to run too far. We have Argentina, again a lady who has an origin of a German. So gentlemen, there is one typical question. Let's pick up these three concrete examples. We have the Pope, who is also a migrant, we have the Brazilian, we have the, Niger the uh, Argentinian facts. These are people on a very, very highest position. So that's the question I have is, 
what do I have to understand out of your positions when the reality, day in to day, showing us a very ex excellent example without having any interference of human right talks, without having any discussions of Amnesty International, without having any discussions of law, commission, and things like that. So for you, the question, do you ever try to understand, learn out of the reality, the facts we have on the news, on the information, facts like leading a state being an, a refugee, that's not an easy position. We have to understand that. So do you ever think of that when you just sit down on your desks and say, okay, we drop all that facts, we can pick up those examples and debate also on the, on the official discussion plates, the first one. The second is, can any of you explain me why do we have, why should the world always rethink, debate, and, and discuss into divisions when it comes to Europe? Tell me what is the issue that the whole logic turns down the moment things move from outside to Europe. Tell me, please. Thank you. Please. I just want to come back to Austria, saying that this is the first big public event I've been witnessing for the last three years. And uh, there has been an event on a resettlement three years ago, a smaller conference, uh, organized by uh, Caritas, uh, the, R the Red Cross and UNHCR, and there has been an event organized by the Azul Coordination where resettlement was part of the agenda. But there has not been such a big event so ever. So I want to thank very much to all the organizations and say that awareness raising in Austria and is a big issue about resettlement. There has been no media coverage whatsoever about resettlement, and uh, there is a folder of, um, about resettlement lying on one of the tables outside, but the need for information and awareness raising is enormous. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Please. hi, I'm Christine Niewald. I'm, I'm uh, talking for Amnesty International because there had been some questions raised um, why we do not get involved in the um, refugee camp discussion that much. And it is just because uh, we had these discussions and uh, there is, uh, we do have amended and we do have like, certain points that we support. And uh, this is access to work, this is access to education, this is access to asylum. And uh, we also do support uh, the refugees speaking up for themselves. Uh, and taking their voice and making their point. But, um, yeah, we were just overruled by the, by the way the protest went on. And, yeah, I think that's the explanation I can give by now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else before we close the public discussion? Okay, then we have a short last round. Would you like to start again? Yes. Do we just work in our offices or do we, so to say, understand refugees? Um, um, maybe two aspects in this context. UNHCI is a global organization with almost 8,000 staff members. Uh, most of them are working on a daily basis directly with refugees in the field. This is a little bit different, um, which uh, I admit uh, in the European context, where we have very limited resources. Just to give you an example, the office in Vienna consists of six staff members, so there are limits what we can do. Nevertheless, in all projects we are doing, we are uh, involving um, asylum seekers and refugees to listen to them, to hear their voices, uh, in order not to say we as UNHCR know what is best for them, but uh, to involve them and to follow their uh, advice. Um, why is there a difference between, if I understood you correctly, as long as, them, uh, as, long as they are abroad and then within the EU? I think this is um, something which I also cannot really understand and which is maybe something which uh, others uh, need to, to answer. We also realize that refugees um, far away from the European Union or in the Austrian context, far away from Austria, 
are the poor refugees uh, for whom um, everybody would like to, to donate something, but as soon as they cross the border, uh, they are irregular migrants, uh, drug dealers uh, and criminals. So um, there is the, the change of perspective um, joining, so to say, the, the flight of, of the refugees who come to Europe. But an explanation for this uh, I cannot give. Thank you. Martin? Maybe, maybe just to sum up and also uh, to, to give an answer to your question, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the example of Pope. I, sometimes I, uh, I use the example of it was not only the Pope, it was Adam and Eve who were the first refugees. After all, they were banished from paradise uh, against their will. But uh, yes, we do understand the needs, although um, uh, sometimes it might seem like, and I do follow your criticism that in Brussels we are sitting in an ivory tower uh, completely detached uh, from reality. Um, this, is, uh, this is the way European Union um, uh, works. Many of my colleagues are practitioners or have been practitioners in, in, in the past. We are in constant touch with member states, with civil society organizations, with UNHCR. So I would not necessarily say that we do not know what's going on um, on the ground. Uh, why the discourse uh, that once they cross the border it's an entirely difficult, uh, diff different situation, I think it was very aptly summed up by my, by my colleague from, uh, uh, from UNHCR. It's an angle from which you uh, look, but it's also a position from which you look that, that defines your point of view. Um, here in Europe we have a tendency to look at refugees as very poor people, uh, whereas uh, there is also uh, a discourse going on at UN level, at uh, UNHCR level as well, to engage refugees as actors and factors um, uh, of development, and it's a discussion that is gaining ground, not only to look at them as victims, but also to look at them as possibilities for growth and possibilities for, for economic development. Thank you. Charlotte? Yes, I mean, just to echo that, I mean, I think you're totally right in terms of how we change the narrative around refugees and, and migrants, in fact, um, who also get a, a bad rap. Um, and, and really trying to, to show that, as you say, people aren't victims, but, you know, in many cases have shown great bravery and courage in, in making the, the journeys that they have and great resourcefulness and who are an, an absolute asset to the countries in which they eventually end up, whether resettled or through applying for asylum. Um, and then just to echo the point about trying to raise awareness, I mean, uh, obviously this is something that Amnesty has been doing and, and one of the things that... Um, we have done recently um, is make two short films, not, not the one that you saw, but um, in fact called A Life on Hold, which follows the story of um, a Somali refugee um, who's 17, um, his life in the camp while he waits for resettlement and then eventually his journey to Sweden, where he now lives. Uh, and that, that, that film is freely available. Um, I can send you copies if you ever want to use it or share it with your friends. It's also online. So let me know and I can tell you about that. It's... Um, it's intended to be a tool that everybody can use to start talking about resettlement uh, with the people in their communities. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Um, three years ago, Aida Chakha, who she is, she holds a professorship of political science at Harvard, published a book which was called The Birthright Lottery. And in this book, uh, she argues that citizenship, the place of birth, uh, which of course is connected to rights, is nothing like a big universal lottery uh, where no one can decide on what place he or she is born, but the place of birth is one of the strongest predictors with regard to status, uh, education, health, etc. of a person. So she argues very strongly in favor of a regime which opens up access to citizenship. And I think uh, from this point of view, uh, we have a very strong argument uh, for supporting uh, uh, all, all kinds of moves uh, to improve the uh, situation of refugees and resettlement is one. But this has and now a link to, to the Pope. Uh, this, is, this has to be settled in a reframing of the story of migration. Uh, the story of migration nowadays is, as most countries, is a story of 
threat, a story of anger, a story of suspicion, and this has to be changed into a story of uh, reducing the importance of the place of birth. And I think that uh, there are these signs. Uh, when, when, I, when I was vis watching the TV and learning about the Pope, I went to Facebook and said, it's the, it's the first, second generation Pope. When we, well, we have the first, second generation president. Um, so things are, I think, moving and we can support it uh, and maybe should continue to support it. So I think we, we also researchers, we do uh, play a part of it, of course, we are not involved in this direct, concrete work. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, I'm not concluding what all has been said, but I definitely know that much still needs to be done in that area, uh, in Europe in particular, and in Austria, of course. Uh, I hope that it did contribute a little bit to awareness raising and also uh, for civil society putting somewhat more pressure also on the Austrian authorities uh, in that respect. Before we close, two announcements. Uh, one of our supporters is Juridicum. Children, we don't have much time. Let's get right to it. It's the end. <laughs> one moment. We are, uh, and Juridicum has also uh, one of its booklets. It's outside for you to take. Secondly, uh, as I said, this is one of our human rights talks. The next one will be on the 21st of May at 7 p.m. Quotas for Women, Yes Please, at the Law Faculty of Vienna University. Um, and um, also after this discussion, uh, we would like to offer a glass of wine outside for continuing our discussions. Um, but uh, now we will also see uh, a trailer uh, by Arman Riachi. Perhaps you would like to say a few words before we see it so that people can also welcome you. Having me, is this working? Do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I came a little bit late to a discussion, so I'm probably not be able to contribute very much on a, continue this, uh, this debate on a very intellectual level. I'm a filmmaker. My brother and me did this. Um, a documentary on uh, civil disobedience and global nonviolent resistance. Um, I've been said that you saw an uh, excerpt of uh, uh, Jordan um, uh, refugee camps. So <clears throat> we would like to show you the trailer. We, use, uh, we didn't want to let this uh, opportunity slip by to make a shameless uh, promotion for uh, um, a cross media project and a cinema documentary which is. Um, uh, based on our own uh, refuge, uh, story as refugees because our parents fled, uh, fled Iran when we were uh, children. And um, at some point we wanted to, to uh, use our uh, very reduced uh, small power as filmmakers to uh, contribute to, uh, to the uh, global civil disobedience fighting oppression and repression. So um, I somehow lost what I wanted to say. But anyway, just look, uh, what, look at this trailer. If you like it, we would... Um, like you to, to uh, contribute if you have ideas to, to get in, in contact with us, to uh, spread the teaser and maybe try to um, generally just uh, let's solve this problem by um, getting to the roots of this. Anyway. Unas nos consideramos más progresistas, otros más conservadores, pero todos estamos preocupados e indignados por el panorama político, económico y social. What is going on? When I first told my father he was against me participating in the protests, I told him that that's what I'm passionate for and I will follow my passion. These are some criminal court summons. I have to go, which will be fun. There's a lot of ways to take space. <laughs> There's never been a movement where people haven't had to go to jail. So the question, are we going to jail on their terms or our terms? I am not protesting. And what I do is give people like you hugs. All you need is a hug. No, you do need a hug. The good thing of nonviolent activities is you always have fun.
people will support you because they're enjoying what they are doing. I think there's been more than one time in history when clowns have brought down governments. It's classic David versus Goliath. Small one wins. If it's only 10 of us, we'll of course not call for the march of millions. Ten people can put between two and three hundred symbols of the movement during one night. And everybody takes this idea that, oh, there is a movement, you know, they're everywhere. And then, you know, people start joining you. إذا في شباب عندهم هاي الأفكار وعندهم هاي النوع من النشاط فهو هدو يستمر بظل وجود أي نوع من أنواع بالأخير نحن نتجرد منه صار We transformed our naked body to special instrument of women's fight. Where did the consumers go? Where's my market? Where are my customers? The consumers consumed! The consumers! Stop it! Our point is to be radical, but to be aggressive, not violent. There is a huge difference. أول مرة بسوريا بنشعر إنه نحن منتميين لوطن، بنشعر إنه مثل اللي كان مخبى تحت شيء وكلنا نفضنا الغبرة عنه ولقيناه. That's ultimately the only way we can really fundamentally change the world that we're in is to rethink it, and you can't rethink it if you think in old ways. Show me what the market's in the night. They are always trying to kill us or to put us in jail. It's pointless because we will keep revolutioning. We, we will never stop. Creo que puedo cambiarlo. Sal con nosotros. Es tu derecho. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof free press free people redress protest in an alert so um yeah i don't really know what to say i'm still here if you want to uh, learn something more about the project um just approach me i will spread some very small business cards here um we still haven't got the real flyers but um yeah, if you have any question, but I think you have enough, um, you, you've talked enough and heard enough, so maybe let's go straight for the wine. Yeah, I think, <laughs> thanks very much to the uh, Riachi brothers for Thank this, you. thanks to our panelists, thanks to Anna Müller-Funk for organizing it, thanks to the European Union for having provided us this space, and now we join all of you by a glass of wine offered by the research platform. Human rights in the European context. Thank you very much.